That's right. That's right. You're only clapping for the news. The, uh, the six o'clock news on Radio 4 is pretty much the only bulletin that I can listen to. I can't watch news on the television anymore. It basically insults my intelligence. If you turn the television on at six o'clock, right, or 6.30 if you're a bit slow and you watch the ITV news, right, the, uh, the old big tall man and little pretty lady going to tell you everything that's happened today. We'll make all the moral judgments for you as well, so that'll take a bit of time, won't it? Come on, Larry! It must be true. We're in a giant clock. <laughs> Oh, they do the editorialise. It's unbelievable. They put the word evil in the head. Like, evil. Like, you know, an evil bomb blast. I know a bomb blast is evil. You don't have to tell me. Let me make the decision for myself. It's just, you know, the only time the word evil should ever appear in a headline is as part of a direct quote or immediately in front of the word Knievel. Those are... <laughs> It's just astonishing. It's, uh, I genuinely believe if you've stopped shouting at the television news, you're clinically dead. I, I'm, not, I'm not a medical man, but if within 30 seconds of turning the telly on, you're not screaming fit to burst, you might as well lie in a hole in the ground and have your friends sing sad songs because it's over for you as far as... I blacked out. Right, this happened. About two years ago, I was watching Tonight with Trevor McDonald, as it was then, and I was sat on the sofa with Ernie the Cat. The next thing I knew, I was on my feet, sort of wobbling slightly, pointing, <laughs> frothing at the mouth. My wife was laughing upstairs, and afterwards she told me that she'd heard me shouting, GO AWAY AND COME BACK WHEN YOU'VE GOT SOME PROPER NEWS! <laughs> Tonight has incidental music. You're a current affairs programme. It's not appropriate, where incidental music is supposed to tell us which way to lead our emotions. That's the job of that music. Don't put it on a news show. But they'll, have, they'll say, and at the age of 12, James contracted leukaemia. And underneath, there'll be Albinoni going, no, 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 no. I think, that's lucky, because for a minute there, I was wondering which way to go on little Jimmy's leukaemia. But as it turns out, it's a bad thing. Not long, I imagine, before they have it on the news. And today, Osama bin Laden, da 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 <laughs> Which thinks he's a bad man. <laughs> I genuinely would rather it was like the 50s, and there was just a man in a dinner suit behind a desk with one of those big lozenge microphones. Good evening, this is the BBC. One of those people. That's Lord Reith. But he picked the BBC English accent because... He felt that the news required gravitas and authority, and so he gave it that sort of RP accent, because presumably he felt that without doing that for the rest of the 20th century, the news would just have been, you'll never guess what Hitler's gone and done now. <laughs> <laughs> He's only got an invaded Poland she could get. <laughs> and as we made our Neville sign that piece of paper, Neville's going to go mental. <laughs> Which is Sky News, essentially, isn't it? That's... <laughs> I always feel with Sky News, it's like they just put a fag out. You just caught them. You're, <laughs> I'm sorry, yes, you're right. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, we have an outstanding bill for you, as ever. We have three wonderful acts. Please, welcome to the stage. Your first act, Mr. John Gordillo. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. I'd like to talk a little bit about my father. Now, my father is Spanish. A lot of people assume that from this sort of demeanour and style of presentation that I have, I'm, I'm a very middle-class person, perhaps even public school educated. This just could not be further from the truth. Um, I am, in fact, half Spanish. I was brought up in a council house. My, my surname, Gordillo, Gordillo, is a Spanish name. And, in fact, John is my middle name. My first name is actually Alberto, Alberto, uh, which, of course, as we know, is the Spanish name for shampoo and conditioner. Um, <laughs> And my father is this very intemperate, crazy Spaniard. I'm, I'm so hello. My name is Feliz Alberto Gordillo. I am the father of Alberto Young Gordillo, the comedian. All I have to say tonight, I do not hear many people laughing. <laughs> but whatever is his problem. Well, so that, that is pretty much dad. He will pretty much drop you in it at any opportunity that he can. <laughs> He's a very jealous, possessive man. He's constantly asserting his fatherhood. Sentences constantly starting with, I am your father. I, I know who you are. Thank you. you don't have to, don't, I, have to, I know who you are. I wasn't wondering who that man was farting on the couch my entire childhood. I know. But my father is a character who cannot express himself unless it is in the most violent, the most self-martyring terms possible. It's always in terms of like the pain he suffered or the pain he's gonna suffer. Like He can't just go, I love you. Like, he asked me, no, Alberto, you know, I love you, I would have stepped in front of a car for you. <laughs> really? Well, I would, I would have, but, but it's a vain claim. You're never going to have to prove that. We're in London. 
the average speed of traffic is eight miles an hour. I mean, please. All you're really saying is you'd be willing to sustain some minor bruising for me. That's really what you're saying. You were just walking down the road. You were out of nowhere. Go read the answers, yeah? I would kill for you. <laughs> well, don't. I don't want that to happen. Don't do that. Well, Dad, why is... Look, I know you love me, right? And I appreciate it. I understand the sentiment, but why does it have to be so violent? Well, if I have a day on, because I would, I would do it for you. It, I, it, it, it's what any father would do for any son in any family. Well, what family? The Corleones, for God's sake. It's not us. <laughs> That's not the life that we lead. You know, what I'm saying is that if anybody was to get in your way, was to stop you getting what was rightfully yours. I will sort it out. I will get in there. I will do it. <laughs> you know, I, I appreciate, don't get me wrong. I just, you know, but the, you know, the week he said this, I had just been outbid for a shed on eBay. <laughs> now, <laughs> I didn't really want to say anything. I didn't, you know. <laughs> I thought to take a shed from my boy, eh? <laughs> well, say hello to my little friend, eh? I said, Dad, I know you love me. I said, just, just don't say anything more than that. Just say, I love you. Don't have it be violent. And that's the end of it. Okay, well, say it. I love you. I love you. I love you. Well, I, I will go to prison for you. No, 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 no. But I would. I know, but when is that going to happen? Look at the state of me, for God's sake. What, some pick and mix caper that went horribly out of control? <laughs> okay. I, have a, I have an eight-year-old son. His name is Gabriel. I love him, but I don't know that I'd kill for him. I don't... Don't judge me with your silence, right? <laughs> Why does it have to be crime involved? I'd certainly erect a shed without planning consent for him, if that's... <laughs> why, why can't minor infractions of the building code be crimes of passion? <laughs> Can I just ask, how many people here eat free-range chickens or free-range food? We have a few people. Okay. My disposition is to be like that. I used to be like you. But I think I've changed my mind. My problem is, is I know I don't have to eat meat. But I love the taste of meat. And I've grown up with it. And I eat the meat. But I've got this guilt thing going on. And it's being marketed to. That I, I don't want me eating the animal to have had any bad effect on the animal whatsoever. <laughs> That's my lie. So I've got this third way food. This, this free range food. I was in my local supermarket a couple of weeks ago in the aisle where they stock the free-range chickens. And um, it's odd, don't you think, by the way, that they stock the free-range chickens in the same place. Surely the free-range chicken would be happier, sort of liberally scattered around the store. <laughs> oh, there's one in chart DVDs. Or, uh, there's one in home baking. Other little critters. They're all cooped up together in a freezer. It makes a mockery of what they died for. <laughs> I'm there and I'm reading the labels that are on the backs of the free-range chickens and I guess the idea is to reassure you but there's a level of reassurance that I don't need. On our farm, we work with animal behaviourists <laughs> which makes life great for our birds. By day, they get to roam freely outside with plenty of space to peck, scratch and generally do whatever it is birds like to do. <laughs> And indoors, they nest in brooder sheds with panoramic views of the outside world. <laughs> and a CD system plays natural outdoor noises to them. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm very relieved that the chickens are getting digital quality sound. I mean, I'm glad of it. <laughs> Certainly put an end to all those animal rights complaints about tape here, so we were hearing so much about in the early 90s. <laughs> but the part I can't get my head around is that the label telling me what a great life this animal had is covering the part where its neck used to be. I can't get my head around that. <laughs> Plus, also, I don't know how I feel about eating an animal that had a better hi-fi than me, but that's, that's a separate... <laughs> I went on a website. This is for an organic farms promotes this on their website. This is, this is what it says. When the birds are mature, they are carefully caught by hand in the early hours and taken to our purpose-built EC slaughterhouse here on the farm. We find, catching in low-light conditions minimizes any possible stress from struggling. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I always find an attack at night so much more reassuring, don't you? <laughs> this gets me here every time. I, but what is it going to take before we're comfortable eating these birds? A suicide note from the bird, would that help? <laughs> You're clearly the superior species. I'd like to be lunch now, please. Just do it now. This is what I don't get. If these animals are having such a great life, 
Don't you think it's more cruel to kill them? I mean, wouldn't it be more ethical, really, to eat an animal that had a miserable life? That wanted to die? An animal for whom death was a blessed release from the torture of this existence. Economy chicken, that's the ethical chicken. There's no label on that telling you how well the bird was treated. That is the agricultural equivalent of a suicide note right there. They always put a label on that going, this bird was screwed from day one, you're doing it a favour, eat. <laughs> I'll leave that with you. Thank you very much, everybody. I enjoyed myself. Cheers. Good night. John Rodillo! The thing about Sky News is... <laughs> it gets all its idiot ideas from Fox, right? It's American sister. Now, the only time, really, ever that I watched Fox for an extended period of time was during the aftermath of the London bombings, immediately after the London bombings, that afternoon. You know when you're flicking through to find anything? Somebody who might have another piece of news... And I ended up on Fox. And what I saw was this extraordinary clash of cultures as they dispatched these American reporters all around London to find people uh, at the bomb sites who had just crawled out of a tube. People who would scream their pity down the camera lens as well. When people would wring out their own soul. People who would emote. And they kept coming up against English people. <laughs> Glorious. So, sir, you on the tube where the explosion happened. What was it like? Well, I would have to say it was probably the most frightening experience I've ever had. <laughs> did you feel you were in any danger, sir? Well, I was in the, in the carriage next to the actual explosion. I must confess, in that instant, I did think, well, you know, Charles, this, this, this could be it. But, uh, <laughs> Wonderful. It was, it was a glory to watch. This one man said something that made me genuinely proud to be British. Right? He was a businessman, I imagine. He had that sort of suit of what had been a smart haircut. He had soot on his face. His, his shirt was out. The reporter asked this man the most asinine question I've ever heard. So, sir, who do you think are behind these attacks? And he said, well, I think that at this stage it's unhelpful to speculate. <laughs> Now, if you'll just excuse me, I have to wipe this soot off. I have a meeting at two. <laughs> right, ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome your next act, Francesca Martini! <laughs> oh. Oh. Wow, thank you. Hello. You are so lovely. Great to be here. Um, as you can see, I've got a terrible palsy. I call it CP because... I'm really lazy. <laughs> and I've noticed this weird thing about my CP lately, right? It really goes up and down a lot. When there's a really long queue at the airport... <laughs> you get the picture. <laughs> and can I just say, when you have a speech impediment, it can be a bit hard, because people don't always get what... You're trying to say, like the other week, it was so embarrassing. I met this guy. I couldn't understand what the hell he was talking about. <laughs> but the sex was great. <laughs> oh, I should tell you about my grandma, because my grandma is so embarrassing with my boyfriend. Um, OK, she's 80, Spanish, and a bit mental. <laughs> and when she meets them, which rarely ever, if I can help it, she says stuff like, Oh, you lovely boy for take her out. She has this problem with her leg, but she's a very nice girl. <laughs> yeah, she's like the best form of contraception that I have ever had. <laughs> she should be available on the NHS. <laughs> A real hopeless romantic, I am. And this is weird, but my ideal man has always been a poor Irish poet. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, my last boyfriend was a rich Swiss lawyer. <laughs> Can't have it all, can ya? <laughs> so um, I feel really happy about Obama, you guys. Um, it's great, and I think it says so much about America. Because they voted in their first ever black president. And before him, they voted in their first ever disabled president. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't he do well, eh? <laughs> Who would have thought America? 
America would be that liberal to put a bloody mental in the White House. <laughs> Incredible. You know what annoys me, though? You know, the Republicans are always going on about pro-life. I'm like, yeah, pro-life unless you're brown and live near oil. <laughs> but I guess talking pro-life, I'm going to say I was a bit shocked. Because about a week ago, I heard that in Britain, couples still choose to have an abortion when they find out their baby will be disabled. So it really is great to be here. <laughs> Thanks, Paul <little> Dad. <laughs> I'm not being judgmental, though. I know it's a complex issue. No one wants an unhealthy baby. And I guess if I'm honest, there are times I may consider it. I can imagine one day being told, I'm really sorry, but your baby boy does carry the defective gene. He will be a Tory politician. <laughs> I'll be like, a Tory politician? Are you sure? And she'll say, yes, we've located the low taxation gene. <laughs> the privatisation gene and the smarmy gene. <laughs> and I'll be like, well, how do you know he won't be new Labour? <laughs> <laughs> and she'll say, good point. <laughs> Look, is there any way I can keep my baby? Would therapy help? Could I... Read them the Tony Ben diaries every night. <laughs> or put Michael Moore on loop. <laughs> or only feed him on my left breast. <laughs> <laughs> what about school? Will he have to go to a special school? <laughs> and she'll say, yes, I'm afraid it will have to be Eton or Westminster. <laughs> But I love kids, and um, I, I can't wait to have kids. Um, I've decided that if I have a boy, I'm going to call him after my father, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> well, <that's so> <laughs> you know, I myself was a really confident kid, you can probably imagine, until I went to secondary school. I think the main problem was I went to an all-girls school, I don't know if you know about all-girls school, but um, when you put teenage girls together, they become bitches. <laughs> Look, the girls in my class used to say stuff like, um, Francesca, no one would ever go out with you. Well, maybe someone like Jesus. <laughs> mm, who would I prefer, Jesus, son of God, or... Your boyfriend, Barry, <laughs> son of... Well, no one knows, really. <laughs> but my teachers were even worse than the kids. Like, you'd think that having cerebral palsy would be a good reason not to play netball, wouldn't you? <laughs> I remember giving my teacher notes that said, Francesca can't play netball today. She's brain damaged! <laughs> <laughs> and my teacher would say, Get on the field, you lady! <laughs> she tried telling me it was all in my head! <laughs> in a way, our culture is very hypocritical because we're meant to be based on Christian values. But, hello, have you seen The Apprentice? <laughs> Can you imagine Jesus on The Apprentice? <laughs> he wouldn't do well, would he? <laughs> Jesus, you let me down! You had the perfect business idea, turning water into wine! <laughs> Jesus, you're a nice guy, but you lost me money. I don't want to hire a prophet. I want to make one. <laughs> Jesus, 
You make your last supper, you're fired. <laughs> Actually, here's an observation for you. Instead of covering Muslim women from head to toe, apart from the eyes, why don't they just do the inverse and cover men's eyes with a strip of material? <laughs> Not a judgment. Just, it would save a lot of material. <laughs> you guys have been absolutely lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. Francesca Martini! Are you ready for your next act? Yes. Please welcome Andrew Lawrence. Thank you very much. Oh, it's a lovely round of applause. Very nice to be here. I'm very excited. I do enjoy performing stand-up comedy just as well because there's no transferable job skills. I went for a job interview. They say, Mr. Lawrence, what skills and experience have you got that are relevant to this position? I say, well... I could poke fun at someone for half an hour and it'd be funny. That's lovely, Mr. Lawrence. It's not really what we do here at Childline. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my favourite thing about this job is occasionally after gigs, someone will come up to you and say, Oi, mate, I could be a comedian to fire the material. Could you? Well done. I could be crisps if I was made of potatoes. <laughs> uh, to you, I became a comedian because I never liked being told what to do. And when I was a child, everyone used to tell me what to do. They used to say, Andrew, don't talk to strangers. Don't talk to strangers. In the end, I got fed up with that thought. When I grow up, that's exactly what I'm going to do with a living. <laughs> and uh, here I am. I started doing comedy. I thought I'm onto a good thing here. If there's one thing women find attractive in a man, it's a good sense of humour. Then I found out that's nonsense. <laughs> Ladies, when you say you find a good sense of humour attractive in a man, what you mean is when you find a man attractive, you will laugh at any old rubbish that comes out of his mouth. <laughs> To be fair, I'm not the best-looking man in the world. Looking at my face is a bit like reading in the car. For ten minutes, it's all right. Then you start to feel a little bit sick, I think. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a ginger hair. I've got ginger hair. I never hear the end of it. Every time I walk on stage, someone shouts out, Ginger! Ginger! Just to let me know I've got red hair. As if I myself might have somehow failed to have noticed. You know, my girlfriend was uh, settled down and had children. I don't want to have children. I told her I've got a low sperm count. She said, that's terrible, Andrew. I said, I know. When God made me, he made me ginger, scrawny with a creepy face. Why did he have to give me a low sperm count as well? She said, probably just his idea of damage limitation. <laughs> this is all the thing she says to me all the time. She's insensitive. Why is that insensitive towards her? She'd bite my head off. Like, all the time she says to me, Andrew, how do I look? Now, she's wonderful, but she's like the rest of us. Some days she looks lovely, some days not so good. But I can't say that. I've got to be diplomatic. She says, how do I look? I say, you look like a film star. She smiles, she's flattered, I feel good, I say something nice, but frankly, all hell's going to break loose once she finds out it's Jack Nicholson, but what can I do? Because <laughs> about communication, any decent relationship is about communication. I'm terrible. Um, she always says to me, Angie, you never listen. I say, yes, please, love. Milk and two sugars. <laughs> You're not listening. To be fair, Petal, you do talk... Quite a lot. <laughs> Maybe you don't need someone who can listen. You need someone who can sift and filter all the things coming out of your mouth, <laughs> extrapolate the important information you might be tested on a later date. <laughs> so, I, I think I became a comedian because uh, I've never... Um, I, I'm just not good at anything else. And uh, when I was growing up, my parents used to say things like, Andrew, you can achieve anything you can set your mind to. The sky's the limits. The world's your oyster. But gradually, as I started to get older, and they noticed a discernible lack of talent, intelligence, charisma, increasingly they stopped saying, Andrew, you can achieve anything you set your mind to, and started saying, try your best, son. That's all you can do. <laughs> It's not a glamorous job doing comedy, it's just driving all the time. People say, oh, don't drive, it's bad for the environment. But the only people who can really afford to worry about the environment are people with too much time and money on their hands. Yes, we just had wind turbines and solar panels installed at home, terribly expensive. £20,000 for the amount of money we save on gas and electricity. 873 years will have paid for themselves. <laughs> we just had 19 different kind of recycling bins delivered by the council for our different sorts of recycling. We've given up our day jobs, we don't need the money. We're too busy during the day, sifting through our rubbish, deciding which bin to put it all in. <laughs> 
Just trying to make the world a better place for our children. Really? You want to make the world a better place? Don't have any children. <laughs> well, let's not pretend they add anything to our lives. They're born and they scream, they cry, they learn to talk, they start asking questions. What's the sky for? It's a roof on the world. Why does the world need a roof? To stop us all falling out. And what does gravity do? Keeps us all stuck to the ground. And why does the world need a roof? It's a very circular conversation. <laughs> Where do babies come from? The same place you came from. Where did I come from? Your mummy's belly. How did I get inside my mummy's belly? She ate you. <laughs> Why did she eat me? Because you ask too many questions. <laughs> but uh, she wants to say, I, I, I don't know, you know, I think babies are ugly. They pop out looking like some shaved chimp that's been showered in elephant snots and... People are not happy they've got an ugly baby. They delude themselves. They persuade themselves they've got a beautiful baby. And they show it to you for validation. Like, look at my baby. You can't say, wow, that's beautiful, because that's lying. You can't say, oh, that's disgusting, because that's rude. But you've got to say something. So you say, wow, he looks just like you. Congratulations. <laughs> and my government wants to move in together and buy a flat. And uh, I'm still renting. You can't buy anywhere these days, can you, if you're a first-time buyer? It's impossible. You know, you go to your building society, you say, hello, I'm interested in the possibility of taking out a mortgage. <laughs> What sort of fairy tale are you living in? <laughs> oh, yes, we could give you a mortgage, but first of all, we need to see your birth certificates, driver's license, passport. We'll need every tear you've ever cried. <laughs> a Rubik's Cube, a Fabergé egg, some snot from the first girl you ever slept with. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's impossible to conduct any sort of um, relationship doing this job anyway. You know, you're very anti-social hours. I get home at one o'clock in the morning from a late night gig. I don't want to go to bed. I've got to unwind. I switch on the television. There's all those horrible adverts on at that time of night, like, Girls in your area, waiting to chat to you now. What? It's two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Why don't they go to bed? What's wrong with these girls? Girls in your area, waiting to... How long are they going to wait? All night, all day tomorrow, I don't want that on my conscience. <laughs> girls, it... Hello, can I speak to the girls in my area who are waiting to chat to me? That's me, I've been waiting to chat to you. Why don't you go to bed, it's late. <laughs> I've been waiting to chat to you, I'm in your area. You're in my area, that's wonderful. Come round, sleep on the sofa, we'll chat in the morning. Not right now, I'm tired. <laughs> No, let's chat right now on the phone. On the phone, fine, but could you call me back? This is costing three pounds a minute. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you've been lovely. Thank you very much. Good luck. You've been listening to Four Stands Up with me, Chris Addison, John Gordillo, Francesca Martinez, Andrew Lawrence. The producer was Sam Michel. Yeah.